Welcome, everybody, for our second uh, book club of the new year. And uh, we're thrilled to have Carolyn Glick here, the uh, famous journalist uh, who is, uh, has won many awards, including uh, one of uh, ZOA's special awards. Uh, and we are um, going to, Carolyn is going to discuss her wonderful book of articles, um, Shackled Warrior, Israel and the Global Jihad. Um, from 2008, which still has a lot of relevance today, and I believe she's going to be speaking about um, how the topic, a lot of the topics in the book, still have incredible relevance uh, to ongoing issues, and um, some of the, the many of those issues have continued to this very day. Um, Carolyn, with that, uh, we uh, are so happy to have you here. Please go ahead. Oh, thanks so much, Liz. Uh, and thank you guys all for uh, coming. It's not every day that uh, an author is asked to speak about a book that uh, she forgot. <laughs> but it, it's actually, that's actually untrue. Because um, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to my friend, uh, Elon Greenfield, who published this book uh, from Geffen Publishers uh, in 2008. And we were discussing a project that we would do another uh, two volumes of my articles uh, that have come out uh, in the intervening years. This book goes up to 2007. And uh, so there, there a few years have passed since then. And, and some things have changed, um, some things have not. Um, and uh, in, in Shackled Warrior, what I did was I, I essentially took five years of columns for the Jerusalem Post and I uh, divided them schematically to uh, various aspects of uh, of the reality that we face on a daily basis uh, in terms of the way that um, the world sees the Jewish state uh, and uh, distorts the realities of the Jewish state, the way that jihad is being fought against, the world is being fought against, uh, specifically the Jewish state, how the world relates to the jihad against the Jewish state, um, and uh, what the true nature of Israel is and what it should be understood to be by, uh, by the United States and by Europe and by all people who seek freedom in this world. Uh, a lot of major events happen during the period that uh, is, uh, is, is um, covered in this book. Uh, Again, I began writing in the Jerusalem Post the first week of April in 2002, and that happened to be the first week of uh, Operation Defensive Shield, which was uh, Israel's uh, counterterror operation in Judea and Samaria uh, that uh, began um, a year and a half after the Palestinians threw away uh, the peace process and opened a jihad against Israel beginning in September of 2000. And uh, Operation Protective Edge, I mean, uh, Defensive Shield, there have been so many since then, fortunately. Um, but Operation uh, Defensive Shield was the most major operation that the IDF conducted uh, against the Palestinian Authority. Uh, because it was in that operation that Israel had to reassert its security control over all of the Palestinian uh, 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 population centers that had been ceded to the PLO uh, in 1996 in the framework of the Oslo peace process. And so Israel uh, uh, transferred uh, the big Palestinian cities or, and, uh, and their major villages to PLO security control in 1996, and the PLO used uh, those uh, those areas, those populated areas, that used its powers of governance and its military powers that were granted to it under the Oslo Accord, not to build the beginning of a Palestinian state, as uh, as Rabin and Paris and their colleagues had promised the people of Israel, but rather they had turned these areas into one enormous uh, terror base. Um, all of the resources that they received from international donors, from Israel that collects the taxes for the Palestinian Authority still today, all of the resources that they received, uh, they either used to line their pockets because they transformed uh, the Palestinian Authority immediately into a kleptocracy, uh, where they stole somewhere between a quarter and a third of their annual budget every year, uh, but also uh, to build a terrorist state. 
So all aspects of Palestinian life were um, transposed from normal uh, operations of a normal society into uh, a terror workshops uh, from the from the cradle to the grave. Palestinian children and adults were indoctrinated to believe that the Jews are the root of all evil and subhuman uh, and have to be annihilated. And the jihad is the quest that they should embrace in their life uh, and that their path to jihad is the annihilation of the Jewish state and that the identity of the Palestinian nation is a Palestinian nation that is mobilized and in a total war against the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. So this was the indoctrination. It went through all aspects of the Palestinian educational curriculum, again, from nursery school through university. It still does, by the way. Um, it uh, came to bear in all of the sermons in every mosque that uh, is under the Palestinian Authority uh, control in all other areas of public and private life in Palestinian uh, in Palestinian society. Uh, what they what they were concerned about was indoctrinating and mobilizing the Palestinian people in the cause of Israel's annihilation. And those chickens came home to roost after the Camp David peace summit uh, in July 2000 failed when Arafat refused Ehud Barak's offer of statehood uh, in all of Gaza, 95% of Judea and Samaria, and in large swaths of Jerusalem, including Palestinian uh, sovereignty over the Temple Mount. Um, he rejected that offer and he and he prepared the Palestinians for war against Israel. And so that was when we started getting the daily suicide bombings in Israel uh, that were coming from the Palestinian uh, Authority, mainly from Judea and Samaria. So uh, the week that I started writing for the Jerusalem Post was the week that the Pal that Israel finally said enough. In March of 2002, 130 Israelis were killed uh, in daily, sometimes twice daily, suicide bombings all over Israel. Uh, and the Palestinian uh, bombers were coming from uh, largely from Judea and Samaria. So uh, um, immediately after Israel began its uh, its counter terrorist offensive, uh, the uh, political war against Israel. Uh, went into high gear. The um, Palestinians announced that we had committed a, a war crimes and a massacre of, of Nazi proportions in uh, the Janine refugee camp, um, which was a complete and utter lie. Uh, we lost 26 soldiers in that battle, 55 Palestinians, 40 of whom were combatants, um, were killed in that battle, which is the lowest ratio of civilians to terrorists, I think, in human history. Um, and uh, those 26 reservists wouldn't have been killed if we hadn't been so concerned with the low ratio of uh, civilians to combatants in an urban area, um, because we would have bombed the Janine refugee camp from the air, which Israel decided not to do because we were afraid that we would be condemned. Well, in the event, we lost 26 of our soldiers and we were massively condemned by the world because um, the people who were blamed for the Palestinian Jihad were its victims, the Jews. And then in my book, I go through the reasons why it is that the international community refuses to accept that Israel is a victim in this and why it is that they refuse to accept uh, that Palestinian nationalism is not a normal nationalism. It is a pathological nationalism that has no positive attributes. It is entirely concerned with the annihilation of Israel um, and the destruction of Israel's moral right to exist in the uh, in the international in the international community. So that it wants to obliterate the concept of Jewish nationalism, the legitimacy of Jewish nationalism. It wants to deny the existence of the Jewish people, deny the existence of Jewish history. Um, so wipe it out, appropriate all of who we are, our identity, our history, um, our land to the Palestinians and um, to kill us and to destroy us militarily through terrorism and eventually other violence as well, including invasion from foreign forces. Um, and, and the reason that I came up with during the years uh, was had several components to it. One is uh, that Europe 
uh, took all of the wrong lessons from the Holocaust. Um, I have been listening to a book on tape, uh, which is uh, Henry Kissinger's latest book on leadership. And in his, uh, and in his uh, chapter on uh, Conrad Adenauer, who is the uh, father really, and the architect of, of post-war Germany, um, he was the, the chancellor of West Germany from 1949 to 1960, I think three or five. Uh, at any rate, uh, he was there for an awfully long time and he was there during the formative years. And Kissinger has a lot of uh, admiration for Conrad Adenauer, but I think one of Conrad Adenauer's most uh, significant accomplishments or dubious accomplishments is that he was able to avoid a moral reckoning for the Holocaust um, by uh, presenting uh, Germany as a new Germany that had uh, that was morally contrite, that made a uh, virtue out of uh, contrition, moral contrition, but actually didn't have any moral reckoning with what they had done in the Holocaust. <clears throat> and instead they universalized uh, Nazism essentially uh, in a very postmodern way and said that it could have happened to anybody and that the culprit wasn't uh, wasn't uh, German imperialism and German anti-Semitism, which had been marinated over hundreds of years of massacre of German Jews and rejection of the Jewish people and the demonization of the Jew in uh, German uh, iconography, but rather it was the result of militarism and nationalism. And that the way to solve the problem of Nazism is not for the Jew Germans to abjure evil and anti-Semitism so much as it was for them to abjure nationalism which they never had anyway because they were imperialists and to um and to become and to become uh uh Europeans and so to subsume german national identity such as it was into a larger european identity and to reintegrate germany in the post war years into europe uh as a uh, member of a post national european identity and Kissinger sees a lot to uh, a lot to admire in Conrad Adenauer, and I I find a lot to uh, despise in him because I think that uh, he he was the architect of Germany's successful avoidance of a of a moral reckoning with what they did, and uh, we uh, see that in. Uh, in the character of the Europe that was forged by uh, Adenauer's Germany. Um, Europe has a couple of components that I go through in the book, um, which are uh, problematic. One is that it never had a reckoning as a continent with its embrace of Nazism. And so it's very attractive to a lot of uh, Europeans to view Israel as the new Nazi because it gives them uh, a way out of, uh, of the crimes that they committed against the Jewish people. If the Jews can be perceived as Nazis, then the Europeans' uh, embrace of Nazism isn't so bad. And so there's an attraction to that. Um, there are other aspects that have nothing to do with anti-Semitism and European hostility towards Jews, like their dependence on Arab oil, which was still very, very strong, and and it still is really, but it was it was a it was a very sig significant component of European uh, strategic calculations in the two thousands and in the nineteen nineties, um, and so they were anti-Israel for economic reasons that they uh, needed the Arabs, um, and they also used their antagonism towards Israel and their hostility towards Israel and demonization of Israel as a way to embarrass the United States because the United States was pro-Israel and the Europeans were anti-Israel. And if they could convince enough Americans that Israel was immoral, then they placed the United States in a moral quandary. They made the United States pay a price and moral prestige by continuing to support Israel. And that was something that advanced the uh, uh, anti-Americanism that was already fairly rampant in, in Europe during the Cold War, and it certainly hasn't uh, hasn't diminished in in success in in the post-Cold War era. 
So it was anti-Americanism, it was anti-Semitism, it was uh, dependence on Arab oil, and 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 it's also um, uh, that uh, Europe itself is very afraid of of Arab jihadists because they have a lot of Arab jihadists on their territory. This was already clear in the early 2000s when I was writing my book, Ilan Khalimi, the Jewish um, French uh, young man was murdered by a jihadist gang in 2006. Um, and there were many other jihadist actions, including the Islamic uh, riots in 2005. So they were also covered in the book. And so you see um, that part of the refusal to recognize that the jihad against Israel is part of the global jihad had to do with European antagonism towards the Jewish state. And then I go through, uh, the book also touched on the United States, obviously, very deeply, um, and Israel's uh, sometimes excellent and sometimes very, very um, uh, pathological relationship with the United States. Um, this was during the Bush years. And so Bush, on the one hand, uh, seemed like a pro-Israel president, but uh, his most significant speeches on Israel and the Palestinians were also the most pro-Palestinian speeches ever made until that date by, a, uh, by an American president. Now, you may recall in 2002, uh, in the midst of Operation Defensive Edge or Defensive Shield, whatever it was called, um, uh, Bush gave a speech on the on the White House in, at the White House Rose Garden, which was much anticipated. And what was he going to say? Uh, the Americans had been calling for a ceasefire, and they'd been calling for Israel to redeploy outside of the Palestinian population centers. This continued to be an American demand, at least publicly, for many years afterwards. And Israel refused to do so. And uh, Bush gave a speech where he called for the Palestinians to elect new leaders and to abjure terrorism. But he also said that the United States would support the establishment of a Palestinian state if they did so. So that was the first time that an American president ever said such a thing. Uh, even Clinton hadn't said it. Um, and it was extremely antagonistic to Israel. And Bush himself was a, uh, was a, was a character that it was hard to pin down whether he was pro-Israel or anti-Israel. Um, and he had his own problems. Uh, he, the strategy that he put together after 9-11 um, was in a way doomed to fail because he never uh, properly de defined who the enemy that the United States was fighting was or who it was that had attacked the United States on 9-11. He talked about global terrorism. Uh, he talked about uh, terrorists with global reach, which meant that he was leaving the Palestinians out of the equation because they were a local terrorist organization uh, group that was only attacking Israel, primarily attacking Israel. Um, but he he never said uh, radical Islam. Uh, throughout the eight years of his presidency, he referred to a militant Islam only once in a in a uh, in a speech that he gave before the Foundation of, for Defense of Democracy, I think in two thousand and six. So he he wouldn't talk about it. He sent the United States into war in Iraq, which I covered from the front lines as an embedded reporter with the 3rd Infantry Division uh, in 2003. And I talk about my experience with US, uh, with, with the 27 mechanized uh, infantry battalion of the 3rd Infantry Division in one of the chapters in the book. Um, it, it includes a collection of my articles from the front lines in Iraq. And, um, you know, during that period, there was, I did have some hope that the Americans were finally understanding what Israel was up against, because on the one hand, the invasion plan of Iraq was um, was was fatally flawed because it ignored the nature of Iraqi society completely. Um, and had the United States uh, taken an example from Israel's uh, experiences in Lebanon over 18 years from the initial invasion in, in 1982 till the withdrawal in 2000. Uh, Lebanon was a society with a democratic demographic composition very similar to uh, to Iraq, but uh, the U.S. ignored Israel's uh, experience in in Lebanon because it uh, viewed itself as as the executive uh, officer of the battalion. Kevin Cooney told me at the time. 
uh, that we were the occupiers and the Americans were the liberators. And so they didn't think that they had anything to learn from Israel. And as a result, they were flying blind when they went into Iraq. They did not understand where they were. They did not understand uh, who their enemy was or how he viewed them. Uh, they had ideas in their head that they were going to be liberating Iraq the same way that their fathers and grandfathers had liberated Paris, and they didn't understand where they were. And they got a cold shower of reality very soon. The battalion that I was with was the first battalion to suffer terrorist attacks. Um, uh, three of the men were killed in a suicide bombing outside of Anajaf. Uh, on the way up to Baghdad, and I talked about that experience, and it was very shattering for them because they didn't they didn't expect it. And uh, but as they learned, um, Israeli trainers came to Fort Bragg and started teaching them how to set up roadblocks. Um, I was working with some of the Marine intelligence officers, explaining how Israel works on intelligence uh, gathering. Uh, in villages, and uh, I don't write about that, but uh, the Americans began to learn how to do counterterrorism and how to do counterinsurgency. But here too, you know, uh, America had this idea in Iraq, uh, which was, I think, very much guided by the neoconservative worldview, which was that anybody would every that democratic uh, liberal democracy was an international ideal. And a universal one, and that it and that uh, uh, aspiration to uh, liberal values and freedom is uh, is a universal aspiration, and this is simply not true. And um, so, the concept of counterinsurgency is predicated in large part on this idea that there are going to be Iraqis who are going to want to become Americans uh, in Iraq, that they're going to want to turn Iraq into America. And and that was not true, um, but the idea of the universalism of uh, the aspiration for freedom under as as seen uh, by Americans uh, was also something that blinded the United States to the unique nature of their relationship with Israel, because uh, if everybody is like America, then there's nothing special about America's most loyal and most powerful ally in the Middle East, and that's, of course, the state of Israel. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, there are ups and downs, not only in the U.S.-Israel relationship, but also in Israel's understanding of itself. Uh, when you have everybody telling you that you're wrong, it's very hard to believe that you're right. And Israel also faces a lot of challenges internally today. Uh, we got another blow with the Supreme Court, 10 out of 11 justices saying that the votes of 400,000 Israelis are worthless and saying that the head of the Shas party, Arya Derry, cannot serve as a, as a, as a minister in the government. Um, so we, in during the period that I was writing this book or, or that the book covers, uh, I was also covering the expulsions from Gaza of 8,500 uh, Israeli law-abiding loyal Israelis who had never broken any law, who had been sent to uh, to establish the communities in Gush, in Gush Katif and in Northern Sinai, uh, largely by the Labor Party in the 1970s that had been promised by Yitzhak Rabin and Golda Meir that Israel would remain in Gush Katif forever. And they were expelled from their homes. And uh, this is part of the internal struggle where we're faced with implacable hatred, both from our neighbors and from the West. And a lot of Israelis would prefer to believe that the world is right and that their people are wrong than to believe that their people are right and that the world is wrong. And uh, so we face a struggle with this all the time. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, we are a beacon for good and for and for truth and for the Jewish people and our way of life and our small civilization in our homeland. And all of these things should be a source of inspiration to Jews all over the world and also to all people who seek to live in freedom in their own unique way. And so I think that the the end of the book uh, was sort of a uh, a reflection of, of also the power of Zionism and the power of Jewish 
belief and of Jewish peoplehood in the land of Israel. And, uh, and, and I think I ended it, you know, on a very positive note, despite all of the uncertainty about the world and, and the sense was that we, we do persevere and we will continue to do so. And, and I just say, you know, in, in the intervening years, a lot of things have happened, obviously. Um, you know, we had, uh, we had Obama, who changed the United States, I think, in a very radical and, and disastrous way for the United States itself and, and, and of course, for its allies and um, here in the region, Israel and the Sunni Arab states. And uh, we had the Arab Spring, which uh, was a fundamental transformation of the Arab world, first for the worse and then, to a certain degree, for the better, because when faced with the existential threat of the transformation of the Sunni Arab world into Al Qaeda land uh, after the uh, coup in 2000, uh, after the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in 2013 in Egypt and or 2012 in Egypt, and then the military coup in 2013 that overthrew them, uh, the Saudis and the UAE and Egypt under uh, uh, under President el-Sisi, uh, as well as uh, other countries like Bahrain, which is threatened by Iran, and even Oman, uh, began to look at Israel and Morocco uh, as, uh, as an ally. And that has to do with the third thing that happened over the intervening years, which is that um, Israel became a regional economic power. Um, today, the GDP per Capita in Israel is higher than Germany. Um, and so Israel becoming a powerful ec economy, a powerful economic force, a, a regional military power, one of the most powerful countries in the world. Um, and uh, the Sunni Arab state's sudden uh, recognition that, um, you know, uh, that uh, the that this whole anti-Israel thing wasn't working for them anymore, and that Israel was uh, their strongest uh, ally in the in their war against Iran and the Muslim Brotherhood, and um, and and the United States uh, radicalization under the Obama administration. Uh, all of these things brought the Arab world much closer to Israel. Uh, today we're on the precipice of, of peace with Saudi Arabia. And uh, if that actually comes about, and 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 I and I have a good feeling that it actually will, then that will be the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And the irony is that the Arab world is bearing the hatchet uh, with Israel at the same time that the most radical forces of Marxist of of cultural Marxism are becoming more and more empowered in the United States. So it it appears that uh, the Arabs are turning to Israel because they believe that the Western world is lost its marbles, uh, and that we are the safest port in the storm, which is uh, which is both amazing and and shocking. But it's sort of a it's sort of an interesting uh, midterm point, at least, of this long journey that we've embarked on since two thousand with the destruction of the Oslo peace pr tr uh, process. And and I think that, you know, um, uh, if I do do a couple more volumes, I think that they'll be equally illuminating. I think that the, the strength of Shackled Warrior really is that for people who are interested in, in understanding the fundamentals that still guide so much of our world, I think that you can find all of them in Shackled Warrior. Um, and um, I think that you, I was talking to Elon about it. I told him that you guys wanted to do this book club with me. And, um, you know, it just goes through uh, chapter by chapter, all of the different aspects of the world that we live in today, as they played out, obviously, in, in the early years of the century. Um, and and they very much are, are relevant, as, as Liz said, to the world that we live in today. So those are, are my thoughts about this old book of mine. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions, obviously. I talked about a lot because the book talks about a lot. Thank you so much, Carolyn. That, that was a one, wonderful, wonderful discussion. I just wanted to let you know that we had many uh, comments in the uh, chat. Um, 
just praising your brilliance and how uh, people love hearing you and uh, you know should be very proud of everything that you do for the Jewish people. Um, everybody, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, um, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, first, you can just write your question in either the chat or the Q&A, or um, if you'd like to ask your question live, either um, raise your hand, there's a raise your hand function, or let us know in the chat that you'd like to ask your question live, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, I'd like to start off with one, and then uh, I have, there are several questions in the q and I'm including some by Clara Lopez, which I'd like to get to right after that, and uh, while we're waiting for other people to ask their questions. Um, which is uh, my my question is that um, actually two two of the things that I you know there are many things in the book that I thought were very relevant to today and two of them were you discuss were were your discussion about Lebanon and the mistakes that were made there and the problems created by the withdrawal in two thousand and then what happened in two thousand six and um, and you know and obviously that I, you know that compares a lot to what happened with the Lapid government. Uh, a terrible deal uh, where they gave up uh, Israel's uh, rights, um, you know, rights in, in, to uh, to its uh, in, at sea, um, and uh, ZOA came out very strongly against that. You came out very strongly against that, but I'm wondering if, you know, fast forward a couple of years, what do you see as the um, further disasters? Um, that uh, would uh, stem from the the uh, Lapid deal, the Le Lebanon Lapid deal, and also in how that combines with um, what happened back in two thousand and two thousand six. And another one is just the you you spoke about in the book was the inability of people to realize that Palestinian Authority, Hezbollah, Hamas, that their goal is genocide of the Jewish people, and and the the inability of people. To realize that genocidal um, motives don't just have to wear Nazi uniforms. So, the, and um, wondering if you can speak, you know, and that seems to be a problem still today. People just don't recognize what the Palestinian Authority is, what Fatah is, and what these terrorist organizations are really all about, which is genocidal organizations. Okay, so. Um... So, so in relation in relation to Lebanon, I mean, I I think that there are a couple of ways that this can go. I think that Lebanon is very related to Iran because Hezbollah is a division of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, and they control Lebanon. Um, and so, uh, one of the reasons why Israel uh, failed in two thousand and six is because um, they've our leadership has been willing uh, from time to time to accept the fiction that there's a distinction between the government of Lebanon, the Lebanese um, the Lebanese army and Hezbollah. This is a fiction that the United States embraces wholeheartedly and has been pushing for years. Uh, but but really this is not the case. It was not the case in 2006 when the Lebanese military was giving targeting, information and assistance to Hezbollah when they were targeting Israel with missiles. They, uh, one particular instance when they were using advanced uh, Chinese uh, uh, land to sea missiles to attack an Israeli naval ship, uh, the guidance was provided to them by the Lebanese armed forces, but not only. And uh, so Israel uh, was willing to accept the distinction that the United States and that the UN was making between the government of Lebanon and Hezbollah in, in 2006. That was a huge mistake. And it continues to be an even bigger mistake now. I mean, Rafiq Hariri was killed by Hezbollah in 2005. In 2006, we had the war. In 2007, the Hezbollah, 2007 or 2000, 2007, Hezbollah won the parliamentary elections. And in 2008, they staged a coup d'etat that began at Beirut airport, where they effectively seized control over the government in an explicit way and of the military. And the United States responded to all of those things by increasing the military support that they gave to the Lebanese military, uh, claiming that this was called institution building. And that was what was most important in order to strengthen the Lebanese state against Hezbollah when there is no Lebanese state because Hezbollah swallowed the entire thing. So... Um, when every time that Israel plays along with this fiction that the United States is pushing forward, 
it gets harmed. And we got harmed in 2006 because we abided by it. We also got harmed in 2006 because of the um, of the of the uh, incompetence of our military leadership. Uh, we were led at the time by a former Air Force commander. The only time that an Air Force commander was made the IDF uh, commander, and he was made the chief of staff in 2005 because he was willing to oversee the expulsion of the Jews from Gaza and northern Samaria, Gaddan Khalut. And he had no concept of ground warfare. Um, and the generals uh, below, uh, who became uh, the chiefs of staff after Khalut, also were completely incompetent. Uh, in 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 maneuvering the troops, and um, so they were put forward with no operational concept and with no rhyme or reason, uh, with insufficient uh, air coverage and with insufficient supplies, um, and so uh, that was a huge problem that was discovered with the army uh, in 2006. And I'm and I fear that not all of the problems that were discovered have been properly dealt with, which is a which is an ongoing concern and. Uh, in Israel. Um, but uh, so Lebanon um, is controlled by Iran. Uh, the United States refuses to to accept this reality and is uh, advancing a policy that's based upon complete denial of reality. Uh, and Israel often goes ahead and goes along with the Americans on this. I think that the there is no solution to Lebanon because Lebanon is a broken society. But I think that um, the head of the snake in Lebanon is Iran. And the most important theater that we have in the world today is Iran, where the Iranian people are, are fighting a revolution against the regime. And they're not receiving international support. They're not receiving American support. Uh, I think that they're going to begin to receive Israeli support because of the new government under Netanyahu. Um, but uh, it's a it's if we miss this opportunity, we almost deserve what we get. And so I think that the most important thing in in relation to Lebanon and really in relation to everything is to support the people of Iran. Um, in regard to genocide and the genocidal nature of the Palestinians, I don't blame Israel for the fact that this hasn't been widely understood. Again, I think that a lot of this is a function of of people who support their goal. I mean, I think that, you know, there are a lot of people on the in the West, uh, in the progressive circles in particular, who support the goal of, of uh, the destruction of Israel. Maybe they don't think about it in terms of genocide because they like to paper over what this is all about. But, you know, they, they think uh, they've been convinced by the propaganda or they are part of the propaganda machine as, as, as uh, card-carrying progressives or jihadists. And... Uh, so, you know, Hasbara, you can't reason people out of something that they weren't reasoned into. If they're anti-Semites, they're probably going to be anti-Semites forever. There are two aspects of, of convincing people of the genocidal nature of the Palestinians. One is that Israel, I think for the first time, may actually have ministers who are willing and capable of conducting serious public diplomacy to uh, go after the Palestinians. One of the reasons why this hasn't happened in a competent way is because um, we've been governed for so long, uh, whether through our deep state or through actual governments, by governments that are committed to maintaining the lie of Oslo, that the Palestinian Authority, that the PLO is a partner in peace, as opposed to a terrorist organization that likes to disguise itself from time to time as Israel's peace partner, but really isn't at all and never has been. So, and I say this as somebody who was on Israel's uh, negotiating team with the PLO from 1994 to 1996 during my military service. So I actually know the people involved and they are terrorists and they do want to destroy Israel. But when you have a leadership in Israel, in the foreign ministry and in the government that is committed to, and in the IDF that's continued, that's committed to maintaining the fiction that we have an ally in the PLO, or a partner in the PLO, then you're. it's going to be very difficult as a practical matter to tell the truth about them, because why would you want everybody to know that your peace partner wants to annihilate you? You want people to support peace because you think that, that you know, there is no solution other than the two-state solution, as the, as the Biden administration says every single time that they mention the word Israel. Um, but the two-state solution isn't a solution at all. It's a lie. It's a way to 
criminalize Israel and place all the blame on Israel for the absence of Palestinian peace with Israel. That's what the concept, that's what the paradigm of two-state solution really is. I talk about this at length in my book from 2014, The Israeli Solution, a One-State Plan for Peace in the Middle East, um, which is just a full-length book. It's not a compilation of, of uh, commentary. Um, and and so, you know, you, you we need to get the truth out about the Palestinian Authority. And I think that this government, unlike all the other governments, it has all members of it are committed to getting past Oslo and moving away from this lie. And now that we have this, it's the first time since 1992 where we've had a government that's committed to telling the truth about the nature of the Palestinians. And when Israel does that, it becomes much easier as a practical matter for organizations like the ZOA to get traction when you guys tell the truth. So I'm hopeful that things will get better on the Hasbara front uh, in the in the in the near future. And that's very helpful, yes, because we're always talking about how the Palestinian Authority pays terrorists to murder Jews and um, honors terrorists and names schools and sports teams after them. And, and uh, it's something that we have to emphasize over and over again. But it, it, having Israeli uh, ministers and so on speaking about that would be really very helpful. And I think to, to uh, you, know, you know, we have to defend, our, you know, defend ourselves and stand up for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, I'm going to uh, read two questions in the chat from uh, Claire Lopez now, and then I guess I'll have Ted Harrison, who's raised his hand, as, uh, and ask his question. Uh, Claire Lopez asks, would you agree that had the U.S. understood and confronted the Iranian regime's role in 9-11, as well as later in Iraq, and by the way, uh, Carolyn did speak about that in her book, um, uh, that we all might be facing not just a jihad terror regime, but an incipient, but not a, you know not an incipient nuclear Iran today. And then uh, she also asks, uh, how precarious do you believe the situation in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan is? Uh, if Abdullah II falls, uh, will we have to deal with another Muslim Brotherhood dominated jihad state this time on the eastern border, completing the it's, it's, uh, Israel's encirclement? And what should uh, Bibi's administration do in that front? Right. Well, um, both of those are, are are lectures in themselves. So I'm just going to give um, uh, brief answers to both of them. Uh, you know, Jordan uh, is a Bedouin minority uh, monarchy um, in a country with a Palestinian majority um, and a very strong uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, King Abdallah has decided to ignore the Bedouin who formed the basis of his regime and to uh, go into Palestinians. Um, and I think he's doing this as the uh, servant of the Pentagon and Washington more than anything else. And I think uh, this is what the Americans have been pushing him to do when he's doing it. Uh, his pro his father wouldn't have done this, but uh, he is, and it endangers his monarchy, because if Jordan is Palestine, then what is he doing there? He's not a Palestinian. Uh, his son is. He's married to a Palestinian woman. Um, so Jordan, um, you know, may end up finding itself in a in a different position. I think a lot of this also is contingent on what happens in Iran and what happens in Saudi Arabia. If Israel and Saudi Arabia are able to make peace, that's going to have a huge impact on Jordan. Um, and uh, it's... Um, it's uh, it's probably going to uh, weaken the king's ability to assert his authority, which may not be a bad thing because right now he's acting as an agent of chaos in a way. He's leading an anti-Israel political war. He's enabling terrorists to operate openly in Amman and throughout Jordan um, and uh, it's not that there are positive act actors in Jordan, but you know what we found in Egypt is that when you have a strong uh, police state or military state, then you also have uh, strong bureaucracies who you may want to work with, and they may be uh, amenable to changing one autocrat for another. So the Jordan deep state is pretty pretty firm. Um, they're dependent on Saudi Arabia, like most of the uh, non-oil producing countries in the Arab world are. Um, and uh, 
and they right now gain their power and prestige from their relations with uh, with the Democrats, in particular in Washington. Um, but uh, I think that this is a very temporary situation. And so I think that, you know, the most important thing when you look at the geopolitical reality of the Middle East is to see everything in relation to other things. So that if you look at Jordan as something that stands on its own, then you're kind of missing a large chunk of the picture. You're missing Syria, but you're also missing Iraq and you're missing Saudi Arabia and Iran. And Jordan is just one actor in a larger puzzle. So if you change the cost benefit analysis regionally uh, for, for the Hashemites or for the Bedouin uh, tribes more generally in Jordan, and even for the Palestinians in Jordan, um, you may end up with a different set of behaviors. And so I think that the dynamics in the Middle East are, are positive right now overall, and that Jordan and the monarchy are sort of hanging on by, by, uh, by, a, by a very, very um, weak branch of the tree and uh, that they're going to actually have to find a stronger branch, which would be Israel or the Saudis and the Egyptians, or they're going to fall and be replaced by something else. I think that the, uh, I think that the, the bureaucracies, I think that the power structures in Jordan and in uh, other states around them are strong enough to withstand the fall of the monarchy and its replacement by another uh, strong men in Jordan, but but I don't know. On the other hand, you have the fluid situation in Iraq, uh, which is not great. In fact, it's pretty bad. And and again, I and uh, and so I would just say, I'm not sure, but Jordan shouldn't be treated with kid gloves because uh, I think that it's important for Israel to begin actually taking steps to make Abdallah change his cost benefit analysis about how he treats us. And I think that we have the power to do that. I think we have the ability to make that power uh, be felt by by uh, Abdallah in a way that would be conducive to more cooperative relations with with Jordan and for Jordan to be playing less of a destructive role in the region. And in relation to um, you know the mistakes that the Bush administration made, um, I, I I think that you're right, Claire. I think. Uh, the Bush administration made uh, enormous mistakes uh, in the aftermath of 9-11. I have my theories about why they did that, but I don't think the theory is as important as the actions it's in themselves. I mean, the 9-11 commission made very clear that I, I don't remember how many, but but a large number of the 9-11 uh, terrorists traveled through Iran. They were training with Hezbollah. They were uh, after uh, the fall of uh, Tora Bora in Afghanistan in 2002. Um, the the Shura Council of Al Qaeda moved to Iran. Um, Iran was behind the insurgency in Iraq. Uh, 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 Zarqawi, the head of uh, the head of the uh, insurgency in Iraq from Al Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, got his orders from Tehran. His operating, his logistical bases were in Iran. His his money was from Iran. His uh, his supply lines were from Iran, and Abu Musab Zarqawi. And and the United States refused to acknowledge this. Uh, the IEDs that killed thousands of American soldiers in Iraq were made in Iran. And uh, while the Americans would acknowledge this, they refused to acknowledge that they were fighting a proxy war against Iran in Iraq, and that Syria was Iran's junior partner in in uh, in directing that proxy war against U.S. soldiers and the Iraqi people. And so, uh, because the United States refused to see the big picture in Iraq and fight the war that it was that was being fought against it. Uh, instead of the war that it wanted to fight, it lost the war that it wanted to fight, and it was weaker in the war that was being fought against it. So is Iran's nuclear uh, breakout uh, position uh, a consequence in large part of that? Yes, I think that the United States made a series of miscalculations, as I said, uh, from the outset of the war in Iraq, in not understanding it, 
in not learning the lessons of Israel's war in Lebanon, in not preparing properly for what awaited it, in not knowing what the society of Iraq was like, in wrongly thinking that Iraqis wanted to be Americans or had any potential whatsoever to transform Iraq into a liberal democracy. All of these things were complete lunacy, and yet they were the concepts that were guiding U.S. foreign policy uh, in Iraq. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> the the larger issue of the nature of the war and who the enemy was and who was directing the war, that it was all Iran uh, from 9-11 on, uh, is something that is continuing to haunt the United States to this day, and of course, uh, the rest of us as well. Thanks so much, Carolyn. By the way, I'm putting into the chat um, uh, ZOA's uh, discussion of the Havlish case, Havlish versus Bin Laden, which discussed uh, at length and examined at length and had findings of fact on uh, Iran's uh, complicity in 9-11 and other you know, ter terrorist actions in, in conjunction with al-Qaeda. Um, and uh, you, you can read the article, and we also have posted the actual case. Um, yeah, uh, Ted Harrison, would you like to ask your question? Ted Harrison, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay. Hello? I, I'm unmuting. Do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. What is your question? Okay. okay. Uh, there's actually two. They're actually, I actually put them in the chat. I'm going to... Uh, uh, amend the first one about the Lebanon oil maritime oil deal. Uh, how is the implementation going to go? Uh, because I actually read the deal and it really doesn't say anything. And so it's like, uh, I don't know how a deal like that could be signed, but um, how how is it going to be implemented? What's going to who's going to come in and, and uh, show compliance, deal with the assets, things like that? That's the Lebanon deal. And the second question is about um, Oman. Where did, how did it go from? A, a country that allowed uh, visits by Israelis, I think Netanyahu visited there, and the um, going to, uh, rumored to be part of the Abraham Accords, to now passing this anti-Israel uh, contact law. Those are my two questions. Thank you. So and the thanks. truth is that I'm not, I don't have a clear answer uh, for Oman, so I prefer not to engage in speculation. Um, again, uh, I think that uh, Netanyahu is working. Uh, you know that that's one of the focuses of his, of his of his strategic push. I think uh, that um, I, I and I think that uh, you know they're going to be addressing that as well. I but I don't have any anything to to tell you about on on that regard. That was one of those things that I keep saying. You have to look at what happened in Iraq in Oban, and mm -hmm. and I haven't gotten around to it yet, so I'm not going to be able to give you an answer to that. And regarding the Lebanon gas deal, um, so. Uh, Total Energy uh, signed a deal with the Lebanese government, um, but the Lebanese government also bought um, uh, part of the uh, of the gas deposit of the Kana gas field, and they don't have any money. So the question was, who underwrote the Lebanese government purchase of the gas field? I think they took a twenty percent share or something like that, and they have zero money. And and the answer that everybody came up with was that that money came from Iran, and that Iran basically bought it. And the other thing is that another of the uh, oil companies or or energy companies that's going to be developing the Kana gas field is is from Qatar, and Qatar is a jihadist state, and it's the Arab, uh, al it's it's Iran's uh, strongest Arab ally. So, um, so this is a very very bad thing. They, they, they basically what, what Israel just gave was Iran and Qatar the ability to base in the eastern Mediterranean across from Haifa. Um, and I don't know how this is going to work. Um, it can't work, uh, essentially, because it's too much of a threat to Israel. It's an absolutely terrible deal. So I don't, I don't really know how it's going to work in an implementation. We're going to have to see. And Israel is obviously going to be watching this very closely, but it also imperils the Karish uh, gas platform, which is which is Israeli because it's right very close to Kana. So if you have Iranian operatives in Kana uh, working with the Qataris and the French, then you know th there's a lot of corrupt aspects to that deal as well. So I I'm not 
I, I, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of, of how Israel came to accept a deal that's such a disaster for us on so many different levels. Fantastic. Okay. Um, let's see, we have so many quotes. We are, <laughs> wow, we are overwhelmed with questions. Uh, Carolyn, are, do you have any uh, time what? limit? Or, or... Uh, yeah, why don't we take another, why don't we take another three questions? Because I actually have to write another article. Um, okay. But I saw that there was one question about Adenhauer that I had wanted to uh -huh. do, and now I'm looking for it. Um, because this is one of my pet peeves. So it's Paul Tartell. Um, so it says, um, I believe he took advantage of a fledgling, desperate Israel and Ben Gurion to gain uh, absolution while also tangibly compensating Israel and the Jews on the cheap. In the Luxembourg Agreement, particularly the payment, as the payment was ostensibly made with American Marshall Plan money, I didn't realize that. How would you proceed with moving forward with Germany, particularly as despite whatever your material support they gave have rendered a little, if any, diplomatic cover? So I, I think that with Germany, the, the thing that we have to realize is that Germany is one of the major uh, European powers that's playing, uh, um, that's waging political warfare against Israel today, uh, Germany, uh, both directly through uh, the German uh, foreign ministry and German government um, financed NGOs, and also through German contributions to the EU, uh, is, uh, is, is financing a lot of BDS organizations um, in Israel and abroad, uh, um, Breaking the Silence has offices in Berlin for no particular reason. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at a German political war machine that's being fought through NGO proxies against Israel. Uh, Germany also votes against Israel at the UN. And uh, so I think that, you know, Israel has to change its policy on, on, on Germany, which has always been to give Berlin the benefit of the doubt when Angela Merkel and now her 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 um, her successor. I'll say that you know they're they are committed to Israel security and Israel is uh, and supporting Israel is a major part of the of the German national identity. So you know what what does that mean? And I think that Israel really uh, needs to begin. I mean, we we did start it in the previous in the previous uh, Netanyahu government over the past year and a half of the Bennett Lapid government we stopped, but it's very important for Israel to make much more of a concerted press against Germany and their hostile behavior towards Israel in international arena and uh, through their support for these um, anti-Israel NGOs. I think one of the things that the Knesset is going to have to do is amend the NGO law, uh, not only to do what it does now, which is to compel NGOs to publish the foreign government uh, contribution that re they receive, but also to make them register as foreign agents, also to make foreign governments appear as sides in petitions to Israel's Supreme Court so that it's actually the state of Germany that's going against Israel. And I think we have to take away the tax benefits that these covenant that these uh that these organizations receive, uh, they, they're tax exempt, they should not be tax exempt. Um, and beyond that, I think that, you know, we should we should begin limiting the amount of money that foreign governments can give to NGOs that are re registered in Israel and engage in political activities. Uh, but all of these things should be done um, above the table. I don't think that quiet diplomacy works with the Germans. I think that they laugh at us and I think that it has to stop. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, we have, I mean, I, we have so many great questions here. Yeah, sort of all $64,000 questions. And I apologize to those that we can't get to. Um, but Albert L. Grusi asks one of these $64,000 questions, which is what will happen with dairy being denied a minister? And will, what will, will the government go down? And you know, what do you think the outcome of that will be? And uh, George Zilbergeld uh, asks another excellent question. Can you Think of a way to change the anti-Israel attitude on college campuses. Um, 
So, Derry, um, look, you know, I, I've written about this at length. I, I am, uh, you know, I'm the, uh, now I'm the senior contributing editor at uh, Jewish News Syndicate, JNS, and I also write columns there. So I have my weekly podcast, The Carolyn Glick Show, that appears at JNS, and I also post it on my website, carolynglick.com. And in uh, this week's uh in, on in this in this week's show, I interview Carol Markowitz, who wrote a great piece in Real Clear Books called "The New Jew." I, I think all of, all of the OA members certainly should want to read it because it's very relevant and it's excellent. But in my opening remarks, I also talk about the reason why we need uh, a massive judicial reform, not not limited judicial reform. And I I would commend to you to go there. But you know, dairy is really just a declaration of war by the court against uh, the government and the Knesset. And basically, if we thought, if President Herzog now has been trying to mediate between the the government and the Supreme Court, it's very clear that the Supreme Court, you know, like Arafat, they just blew up the negotiating table because they said that a senior, uh, that, that the, the head of the, the Shah's party is not allowed to serve as a minister in the government. And you know, my my friends who were reading the uh, Supreme Court decision before uh, uh, before I started this webinar with you, I, I haven't had a chance to sit down and begin to read it even. Um, it's 143 pages. But they said that uh, they've kind of made a hermetic argument that makes it very difficult for, for Derry to return to office. Um, and and uh, I think that this is just an act of aggression against the government. But so much of what the Supreme Court has done in recent years has been uh, so disastrous. Uh, we have, you know, the majority of Israel, uh, the the very large majority of Israelis want Israel to remain a Jewish state and are Zionists. And the vast majority of Supreme Court justices are not Zionists, and they support terrorists against Israel in case after case after case after case. They support Arab irredentist um, land thieves against uh, Israel and refuse to allow the law to be enforced against them in any significant way. They support illegal aliens against Israeli citizens in South Tel Aviv and other working class uh, neighborhoods where that have turned into crime scenes like Chicago, you know, because we have these very, very violent illegal immigrants from Eritrea and Sudan that uh, violently rape Jewish girls, Jewish old women in their homes, violently beat Jews on the street, you know, and, and there are courted rights that, that Jews in Israel don't receive from the Supreme Court. So we have uh, a very, very Zionist people uh, and public, and that's manifested in the way that people vote in elections and the way that they live their lives very committed to the Jewish uh, uh, identity of the country. Um, and we have a Supreme Court that is overwhelmingly post-Jewish, post-Zionist, and hostile to all of the values of the public. And they've now said that not only uh, do are they above the Knesset and the government, but they don't even have to use law as the basis for the decisions. Their decision against dairy was argued on the basis of reasonableness. And certainly I think that their views are unreasonable just as they think that my views are reasonable, but they are Supreme Court justices and they, they're, what they say goes. I disagree with almost everything that they believe. And yet they're using their values to determine what can and cannot happen in Israel. This is a form of, of dictatorship. This isn't, uh, this isn't democracy. So I think that the dairy, the dairy decision is just another clear indication that we have to go through major, major judicial and legal reform in Israel. And uh, the anti-Israel anti campus stuff, look, I mean, I think that Jews have to stop sending their kids to these schools. I think that the Jewish parents should be sending their kids to universities in Israel or, you know, should buy a university, kick out every single person who is anti-Israel on the campus and make it safe for Jews. And I think that it, Jewish Americans have to stop uh, looking uh, for, I think that it's important to stop debating anti-Semitic propositions. Does Israel have a right to exist? You know, it, is Zionism a form of racism? These questions are, are anti-Jewish and, and Jews don't get anywhere by debating them because it's saying, I'm, you know, this is like the Ramban, the Ramban, you know, in, in pre-Inquisition Spain, 
uh, having these having these disputations with uh, with uh, with converted Jews who come in and talk about and and the Ramban makes this great case for why the Torah is true and and uh, and and not evil and the converted Jew comes in and says the exact opposite and uh, he may win but the Jews are still expelled. There's no point in in having these disputations. That's what they are on college campuses. And I don't think that Jews are given any ability to uh, express themselves as Jews freely on, on many of these campuses. And as a result, their parents shouldn't be spending money to send them there. And the students shouldn't be wasting their time uh, learning there because they're not gonna learn anything worth learning and they're not going to get anywhere worth going to by subjecting themselves to indoctrination of bigotry against themselves. So I think that the Jews simply have to stop going to these schools. So Carolyn, uh, should we wrap up now? Is that? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think that the most important thing, no, I, I think that the most important thing for us um, is to, Recognize, and I talk about this in Shackled Warrior, and I think that it's sort of a theme that goes through all of all of my articles, is that we really have nothing to apologize for. Israel is is just the Jewish people are extraordinary. Um, we don't have to be universal in all things, and we don't have to be all things to all people. We're one people. We're a small people. It's true, you know our our heritage has formed the basis of Western civilization, but we're not only Western, we're Jewish. And, you know, we, our, our heritage and our civilization is eclectic and we take things from all over the world. And, and we always figure out a way at the end of the day to move on when things start, you know, not working out in one way, we have enough different aspects of our, of our identity to be able to move in a different direction. And I, I think, you know, we we have to. We I I did a podcast which I really loved um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, with uh, um, um, hold on a second. Um, I I I did a podcast a couple of weeks ago with um, with Richard Landis, who who was one of the people who was working very. Uh, one of the central figures exposing the lie of the Muhammad al-Dura blood libel, which was the blood libel that said that IDF forces deliberately murdered a Palestinian boy uh, at Netzarine Junction in, in Gaza at the beginning of the Palestinian terror war on, on September 30th, 2000. Um, and that, that blood libel formed the basis of the, of the, um, uh, propaganda war against Israel um, and Jews uh, from then on. And so I, you can go to my website or to JNS and, and see it. Uh, it's an important, it's an important, uh, it's an important conversation, I think. He has important things to say. And we were talking exactly about this time that the articles in Shackled Warrior also cover, which is the beginning of the global jihad and the Palestinian jihad against Israel. Um, and um, I think, you know, we, we see an effort on the part of Jews um, to somehow legitimize the allegations that are made against Israel in order to get by in an increasingly, uh, in an increasingly uh, hostile uh, outside world and first in Europe and now increasingly as well in the United States. And Jews never get anywhere by apologizing for who we are or for what we do and for what we stand for and what we believe in. And that's really the secret of Zionism, that Zionism, even when we didn't have a state, gave us a grounding and a national identity that we were able to, uh, to cling to in order to withstand the pressures of others to uh, to to um, conform and to abandon what is most essential about our Jewish identity. And I think that the stronger our identity is as Jews, the stronger our Zionism is, 
um, the more capable we are of facing anti-Semites and facing, uh, you know, uh, anti-Zionists, uh, anti-Semites, Nazi anti-Semites, jihadist anti-Semites, leftist anti-Semites, whatever they want, um, and and know how to defend ourselves, even if we don't have all the greatest arguments uh, at the ready at any given moment. So I think we we're an extraordinary people, and and uh, we should we should revel in that. And we should teach our children that they should be proud of themselves. And I think that um, the more that we understand about ourselves, the easier it is for us to deal with things. Um, things are a lot better in a lot of ways than they were in 2007 here in the region, largely because of the shifts in power. Um, and also, ironically, America's abandonment uh, of Israel and, and the Arabs uh, during the Obama years, and now again with, with Biden in power, has really brought the Arabs and the Israelis together in a way that we haven't been before. And we wouldn't have been if Obama hadn't struck out on such a radical route uh, for the United States. Um, and so, you know, that's good. And Israel's economic uh, prowess is excellent, certainly means that you know, we're not just some sort of a refugee camp and that Jews who want to have a high quality of life from the United States can certainly consider in a very significant way moving here. You know, it's not like the old old joke that uh, how do you make a small fortune in Israel? You come with a big one. Uh, you can actually do well here. And, uh, you know, our our kids are are the freest Jews. And I think the most privileged Jews to have ever walked the world. I, I'll just tell you one last thing. My son Yoav is 13 and uh, he's in eighth grade and he just came home from an overnight hike. Uh, he's doing a three-year program with his junior high school where they walk the entire uh, Israel trail over a three-year period. Um, you know, I send him to public school, both of my boys and uh, they, their religious schools um, and they, get much more Jewish learning than I got at my Jewish day school, which I thought was great in Chicago. Um, and it doesn't break the bank. And I mean, I, I don't know. I, I almost feel bad for, for American Jews because Israeli Jewish kids have, it's so good here. And I, I, I mean, I, I really would consider, I, I think that everybody should think about making Aliyah also. I, mean, I just think that, with all of our problems and with all of our challenges, I think that the Jews of Israel are the luckiest Jews ever. So uh, those are, you know, my parting words for this evening and uh, or afternoon your time. And uh, and thanks for having me on. Thank you so much, Carolyn. This has been just a fantastic program. Um, I'm sorry to all the people who had other great questions that we didn't get to today, but um, we'd love to have you come back when your new book is published or new new set of books is, is published. And I'm going to turn this over also to Alan Jay to speak about some upcoming ZOA events, including a wonderful uh, ZOA book club uh, scheduled for February 9th. And um, more Klein is going to be speaking. Um, the, Jackie has already put the information about that for anybody who wants to sign up uh, or attend. Uh, into the webinar chat. So you have the links right there. And, and Alan, please uh, take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Carolyn, thank you so much for being a friend to ZOA and for everything that you're doing for Israel and the Jewish people. I think I speak for everybody that's on this webinar that we're always so much better informed after we hear from you. So yes. kudos for everything you're doing. Yasha Koch, Kola Kavod. Keep it up, please. Should God give you strength. Uh, thank as you Liz very mentioned, much. Oh, you're, thank you. Um, Liz mentioned we have a lot of programs coming up. Thank God we're coming out of this pandemic and we're becoming much more active. Tomorrow, ZOA President Mort Klein is speaking at uh, Florida International University, uh, speaking together with Dumasami Washington, the CEO and founder of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. They're going to discuss building bridges to fight racism, anti-Semitism, and all forms of hate. So if you're in Southern Florida, that is open still to people if you can register. Um, on Sunday, January 29th, um, Mort is also going to be speaking in Florida at the Gross Family Center. Topic of discussion there is that you've heard the lies about Israel's occupation, settlements, Jerusalem, Palestinians, moderate leaders, a Palestinian state, apartheid, Palestinian refugees, 
now you get to learn the truth. Uh, so uh, it's like a, a webinar with, with Carol and Glick. You go listen to Mort, you'll also be far better informed than you are before you hear Mort. On uh, February uh, 8th, uh, this hasn't yet right. been announced. No, nope, on February 8th, uh, for those of you in the New York City area, we're gonna have a donor society um, program in our corporate offices. We're going to be hosting, together with friends of ours in Israel, the Heartland Initiative. We'll be hosting Brigadier General Amir Avivi and Mordechai Kadar. So uh, watch for an email. It should come out in the next day or two. And on February 9th, um, I, together with COA Director of Government Relations, Dan Pollock, will be hosting, uh, guest hosting in the next COA book club, uh, featuring David Bernstein, his book, Woke Anti-Semitism, which I strongly recommend to everybody on this on this uh, webinar, on this book club. Uh, David is former president and CEO of, uh, whoop, I just lost my, my page here. Hold on one moment. David's a former president and CEO of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. He's held senior roles at AGC and the founder, he is the founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. Uh, he identifies uh, anti-Semitism embedded within the woke movement. Uh, and we're looking forward to that discussion. So Liz, take it back over. Uh, everybody sign up. We have very informative programming coming up and we look forward to seeing you all. Just wanted to thank everybody. And I see uh, Don Yonah summed it up with Vasha Naha Ba'aba Yerushalayim. And that's a great way to sum up uh, Carolyn's uh, talk. And thank you everybody for being here today. And we look forward to seeing you at, at the next program. All the best.